Don't be too polite, girls, don't be too polite. Show a little fight, girls, show a little fight. Don't be fearful of offending in case you get the sex. Just recognize your belly when we won't look back. All among the bowl, girls, all among the bowl. Keep your hearts full, girls, keep your hearts full. What good is a man as a doormat for following a deal? It's not their balls, we're after it's a bad square deal. Don't be too polite, girls, don't be too polite. Show a little fight, girls, show a little fight. Don't be fearful of offending in case you get the sack. Just recognize your value and we won't look back. Welcome everyone and um, every time I've done this over the last now what looks like 20 years it's different because the context is different. Sometimes I go into character as a pre-dynastic woman around the period 69 to 74 when I was actually in that first women's liberation group but I think this time because we're actually talking about museum practice and feminism and museum relationships I'd like to just sort of be myself and um, for in the beginning and talk a little bit about what this project grew out of and what my aims were and how 20 years later it still isn't finished because it never will be because that's part of what it is. It's a critique of museum practice wrapped around the history of the women's liberation movement and my own personal journey as I get older and have shifting perceptions all the time. When I first did it, by the way, what you're looking at here is Sydney. In 500 years' time, they were able to somehow extract this image. It shows quite clearly by the, the vaginal nature of the harbour <laughs> and the imagery is very clearly female. Uh, this became much clearer by the uh, mid-20th first century. Um, how geography um, mapped the body. Um, what I did was in 1974-5, um, as feminism was moving into a phase of great unpopularity and we were all being told we were fossils, having studied archaeology as an undergraduate, I thought, well, let's become them. And at the beginning of this project, which was a museum critique project, which I did at several conferences, I decided to invent the satire around archaeology methodology using verisimilitude, using uh, shamelessly stealing from everywhere possible. This is Sydney Harbour after climate change um, with the Opera House Mountains and desertification of city. And we're in 500 years into the future, right? And we're looking for our site. And as you know, we're in archaeological practice. Finding the site is absolutely critical. This is the site of 67 Glebe Point Road in 500 years' time, so we were able to dig it. Now, you'll see, if you look down the back, there are all the models and the artefacts and things, and there are lots of charts showing the site, the dig. When this first happened to me, I wanted to do it in the spirit of the uh, women's liberation movement itself, which was always taking the mickey. For example, here you have... A mosaic showing shopping trolleys and all sorts of things. It became very clear to me that I could do whatever I wanted, basically, so long as I maintained honesty at the core. So the women's erosion movement in Sydney did begin in this house, 67 Glebe Point Road, still there. I think it's a coffee shop now. And so I was able to slowly put together material from the site, but all the time trying to decontextualise this was a personal odyssey, I suppose, at the time, although I was thinking of the audience being, who knows? I mean, I've, the audiences, which we could talk about later, have been very diverse. I've had students, I've had um, peers, I've had inside audiences, women who didn't relate to feminism at the time, what have you. But it, it, there's always got to be a way in. In any sort of um, exhibition practice, you've got to have a way in that opens up the field. So then I was able to locate more clearly the building structure and prove quite conclusively um, that if you overlaid a drawing of Avebury, you could show, in fact, that there was a circular grid in Glebe showing quite clearly that this was indeed a sacred area, a sacred precinct. But this led, of course, then to vast new research, thousands of PhDs. <laughs> on 
reading the landscape in a whole new way, in a women's way. Now, this is the building which you can explore. The model is up the back there, which I constructed, and which is as accurate as possible, from my point of view, of my memory. The front room where we held general meetings, the banners are re absolute replicas, and we, after we came back from the demos, we hung them back up on the walls like that. So they were kind of decorative in between being used. If you look in, I gave it a bit of a clean up, but as, as someone once said, it, it's not accurate, it's too clean. <laughs> when this takes its final form, which I've never been able to figure out, is it a book? Is it a CD? Is it a movie? Is it a what? I don't know. And that's why it keeps on not ever being over, because I don't actually... I have to trust that it'll find its form before I die. And if you've got any ideas, that would be great. But, <laughs> but it's some, And I keep adding new material as well, because, in a sense, it has that open-endedness. And it reads all the time off museum practice, which I've become more and more interested um, even though I think it's underpinned with archaeological methodology more. Museum practice is really wonderful and it's very performative because it deals with the public. And so, for example, when I had the very first exhibit of it in 95, I included what I called a bad museum shop, which was where, you, you know, when people, when archaeologists and others, they go to a site, you've got to find some completely trivial thing like a bottle top or something. And that becomes the signifier of the entire show. Right? So, and you buy this stuff in the museum shop. So we had a, a bad museum shop, various trinkets and things. And there was always a great fetish market around the women's movement, as we know, still works, you know, double-breasted <laughs> things from everywhere. Not, you know. And it was always funny. We were always funny. I think that, that what I was really struck by the poignancy of one of the papers earlier of someone who felt, the, the young woman who felt like a kind of, was talking like an outsider. And I understand that, and, and that shift will happen in her, just as it did for us. You know, and people used to say to me, oh, I wish I'd been born, I wish I'd been there in the 70s. And I say, oh, yeah, I wish I'd been there in the 30s. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a perception question. But really, to try and get inside that kind of mindset is quite difficult. But artefacts do help you. So this was just a fluke shot, but I definitely think an apparition appeared at some point here. <laughs> and wrapped all around this, of course, are the actual artefacts. But the, the building was like this. It was in Glebe, and the meetings were in the first room, and then the Me Jane room, which was the newspaper that we produced, was in the second room. And all I've done in the model, you'll see, is put a photograph of one of the walls on the wall. When we finally worked out what to call the damn paper, someone's painted it on the wall and uh, that remained our office for four years until we moved on. And I've written an essay about this in the book. So something about um, artefacts becoming part of a model is also, um, there's a dynamic there. I don't know whether it was just because I, it's my memory or whether you know, someone else could have made this model. I don't think anyone could have. And anyway, what is the status of this model now? And this model, what is it? It's 20 years old. It's now an artefact. I went through looking at the previous history of the building and uh, some of the characters and figures that, that appeared in the building. For example, I talk in the essay about this, that uh, uh, Vera Figna, who was in fact a Russian revolutionary from the 1880s, was the, was the person who we used to authorise all our publications. And if anyone was arrested, they were Vera Figna, etc. So it's, it's a bit like the Karen Silkwood story, right? And so then I had to dig her up. So you'll see on the model when you look that I actually was able to find her bones in the backyard. And it's not hard, you know, you can actually prove anything. And here's her grave. And she lived till she was obviously about 130 or something. And then I consulted with an archaeologist, the wonderful Annie Bickford, who was also part of this organisation back in the beginning. And she is a privy specialist. That's toilets. So, of course, I had to find a toilet and I had to dig up the toilet. So I did that. So I also did a lot of calculations on the alignment of the building. Now, for example, I've proved that in the room where the Gestetner appeared, which is here... Um, at the winter solstice, the sun <laughs> travelled through the laundry door and struck the Gestetner. <laughs> it's very easy to prove. 
So what was happening, and I was just trusting my mad brain in all of this, was that all my reading in goddess cultures, Maria Gimbutas, how archaeologists approach sacred sites, and then we had to have a goddess. There had to be a goddess. Everyone finds a goddess. So I made a goddess. I call her the goddess of Glebe, and she's made from broken cups and saucers and teapots. Remember the stories of the snake goddess and how the snake goddess was found in Knossos. And they, it was obviously a snake goddess, except they didn't find the head or the arms or, you know. <laughs> well, you see, it's, this is the same thing. Covers. I was trained as a historian, so I keep things. But being also having a strong art practice and being a, a exhibiting artist for all these years, somehow or other, for now, it looks like almost, well, is it 40 years or more, I've kept all this. And my, one of my questions is, I don't know quite where it goes, not yet. I don't like these stories about collections that come together and then founder. That's really something that, if you want to know the answer to some of these reasons why everything's still in people's drawers, we don't trust anyone yet. And that's not personal, but that's a big question. It's a big question. This was when we did the first big exhibit, um, and I created a lot of artefacts. And there's the goddess of glebe and uh, other things. The humour was very important. So when I've shown it to students and things, I think, you know, like humour, like, as Voltaire said, it's the most dangerous thing of all. It's very important to make it funny, not only because we were very funny, but because it's a really funny story and also it works and also it gets you in. I call those sight gags. It's an archaeology joke, you see. So the goddess of glebe we have. People gave me various objects. Um, like that T-shirt, which was given to me by Barbara. Well, not given, I had to give it back. I had to give it back. You know, someone made that point earlier today by Barbara Levy, who had been in that first group with me and, in fact, got me into the group. And it's a story I like to tell, which is that I was standing outside Fisher Library at Sydney University and heard Barbara Levy giving a speech on the front lawn and she just said the words, women's liberation. Now, I've never forgotten that moment because I knew what that meant in some sort of strange, cosmic way. As a young student, these words, women's liberation, just went clunk, clunk, and my life changed forever. And then I followed that through, I joined, etc. But there was a shift happening at that moment. And trying to create a piece of artwork, a mixed media work of any kind that can show you perception shifts is very important. So the first perception shift got me into women's liberation. So this project's about trying to move me on from it and contextualising it, and it keeps changing. It's like I just took the genie out of the bottle and won't ever go back in. When I had space in the beginning to do this, which is at Macquarie University, I was able to lay the whole thing out, and so I claim, of course, that it was dug up and found all this, these artefacts were found in these old sewer pipes. And that it was considered at the time and increasingly over the centuries more important than the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> now, um, in carbon dating terms, this is an interesting question. <laughs> the closest to now, this is before thermoluminescence, which I can do, but and, and I can do other forms of techniques now, but in carbon dating terms, the closest you can get to this period, 69 to 74, it's plus or minus 50. Think about it. Plus or minus 50. Wow, for us, the difference in what object and meaning has over a 50-year period. That's as close as you can get. By the way, I call it the pre-dynastic phase, 69 to 74, because after that, International Women's Year happened in 1975. Money flowed, reputations were to be made, Power struggles increased, although there were plenty before that. And so I say that the period, pre, the pre-dynastic period is a pure ideas period. In modernist terms, I think the equivalent is the birth of cubism. <laughs> and it lasted about the same amount of time. And if you look, I also say that things like me, Jane, were like a good rock band. It couldn't have lasted. It exploded. Because you've got to find models that explain this tremendous eruption and the fact that it's now 40 or 50 years of unfolding, unpacking, 
We should not beat ourselves up about the changes. This is the nature. This is the nature of the change in ideas. Where do ideas come from? Think about where eruptive ideas come and for how long they're here. They're not here for long. They come, you take the ride. If you're lucky, you're one of them. I feel like I was very lucky. But then there's history needs the unfolding and what sometimes feels like reverses effects. I think they are often reverses. It's not a good period we're in at the moment. We all agreed at the time and since that in this temple precinct and this group that could only by future historians for a time be read as a cult, that there were four core principles. Every time I've given this talk in any context I've asked this, but particularly of feminists from that period. Do we agree? The personal is political, sisterhood is powerful, direct action, consciousness raising. And they were the four core principles. I was lucky enough to find them on clay tablets. Well, I'm not <laughs> quite happy they haven't, but anyway, moving right along. Now, when we launched it in Adelaide, my dear friend Julia, who's up the back, who's Edna Ryan's daughter, and I must want to say that Edna Ryan, who I'm sure you all know, was a great supporter of this project and helped us raise the money to take it in a truck to Adelaide when we went there in 96. Julia launched it formally as I, we wrote a character for her. She's Professor Dame Hildegard Gumbutus, <laughs> in honour of Maria Gimbutus, and launched the site in which she did an in-depth analysis of why the site was abandoned. And clearly, as you'll see if you look at some of the artefacts, because unbanked checks were left in the building, <laughs> so there clearly had to have been some catastrophe and the, the building was abandoned in 1974, and that it was an unfortified site, etc. So she gave, and that's all been filmed. I was able to collect DNA samples of the women, um, some lists of the names. I'm just giving you a sense, because you're all museum sort of people, that you'll like this. This is, these are the kinds of artefacts that we're able to use. <laughs> Attacking um, Bob Hawke in 1971 at the first Women in Trade Union conference. Some of the earliest most important people. Martha Kay in the beginning now, Martha Ansara, who is a renowned filmmaker now, who came from Boston Cell 16, Women's Liberation Group, into the Glebe Group and brought tremendous material for us to use, etc. Bessie Guthrie, who arrived, I've written about her in, in my essay, she was in her 60s, making the point that we were not all young women by any means. There was a great class and age mixed in the Women's Liberation Group in Glebe. She was the one who led us on all the great campaigns against the child welfare. Kate Jennings, who I think is probably the best known. Now this is just to prove that, and I've got this artefact at the back, this is to prove that you can prove anything. I, when I first exhibited this, someone who knew Kate and I well and who's a very well-known professor came up and said to me, oh, how did you get Kate's dress? <laughs> it's quite clearly not the same fabric. <laughs> but you see, that's how we don't see. Here's, this is the layup of that famous speech of Kate's, which I still have kept the layup. This is to show you the early print technology. One of the times when I did it, and I liked that the, uh, the reporter there thought that this was an equivalent of the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Where did women's liberation come from? of actions that we took, where we all dressed up as men and went to the peach from in and uh, to demand that women have pay the same price in the bar. You know, you had to pay more if you, if you drank at the back of the pub. Humour was a great part. We had fun. These were not earnest only. This was, that's me on the right there. So I have my father's Masonic badge on here. <laughs> let me, um, some of the early material, uh, the Gestetna, <laughs> Letraset, printmaking equipment. And now I call these cellulose fibre objects. <laughs> Lots of them. And of course there's a great deal of exchange. Trade routes were very, very active during this period. Masses of material passed across. I kept all this stuff. I call these digitised incised sound etchings. That's for our collector person, that record. Tremendous amount of material, artefacts. So the talking about where it all is, is a curious question because 
it was all about artefacts. Certainly, words were very important, but the privileging of text in our culture is ridiculous. I mean, these have text all over them as well, but you know, this stuff is still there. Now, these, these kinds of jokes. This was, <laughs> it says, unidentified ritual object related to a bird cult or a bird fit. Now, this actual speculum came from the Our Bodies, Ourselves Collective in Chicago who wrote that book, and a woman gave it to me when I did this show in Connecticut once. So it's been somewhere. <laughs> But again, I think someone made that point earlier. I've forgotten your name, but you made that point, that there will perhaps become a time when these objects related to women's liberation no longer can be understood. And this is for us to see that. I don't necessarily want to create a sense of urgency about this. I prefer us to be able to joke about it. But on the other hand, everything shifts in its meaning because of its context which is an, a reason why I've, what, having once got this show going, I was never sure quite where it was going and what for, but I think it, that doesn't matter now. I've kind of come far enough for it not to matter. Well, clearly I had to study the, the diet of the women. And this very complex bones analysis proves that in the first two to three years of the involvement in the temple precinct, the women lived on hamburgers, fish and chips, co a coffee, etc. And that unaccountably, they started eating tofu and bean sprouts <laughs> and it completely changed the shape of their bones. <laughs> this was a really profound study, hundreds of PhDs on that. Here we've got objects of commerce. This definitely strengthened the argument for that there must have been a catastrophe for the site to be abandoned because clearly nobody in their right mind leaves unbanked cheques. So we have all these hundreds of dollars of unbanked cheques. It's only a $3 subscription, so these days, who knows? But anyway, um, so we have commerce. Some cheques were too interesting to bank, like from Abbey Rockefeller. Um, now this is um, fossilised fish and chips. <laughs> found at the site with a, an authentic cockroach. Now, this is a very interesting, very interesting artefact. Men like this one. <laughs> I think that the history of the period is partly about perception shift itself. And so the, play, the playfulness with objects, this is the one that made it onto the poster. But you could punch a hole with it. There's a palette. You can't decide. The more we know, the more we don't know. When this moment comes, you know after it's come. <laughs> you know, I watched a, a one-hour interview with Hannah Arendt yesterday. It was riveting from just after she'd done the Eichmann book. And she smoked the entire hour. And you know, now that looks so weird. It's so interesting. This is a good one. Now, you know, so this is a good one to show that sometimes a, a, there's a limit to a joke. Seagrass matting, right? Now, if you're old enough, you know that when you were a poor student, everybody had seagrass matting, I thought. So, but a lot of people don't recognise what that is anymore. But, of course, here it takes the form of seagrass used to breed the sacred cockroaches. <laughs> but that's... In this context, I feel we can talk about this. What are the limits? to meaning of an object. I think an object like that can find its ongoing meaning by being part of the show. But that's all. That would be its current context. Of course, the badges. We had better dead than weird ones. So we used to go and stick them in shops. Study from the toilet, this is feminist poo, and then discarded objects. There had to be a privy study. I think you've got a rough idea about what the trope is. So these are all artefacts now, our journey to somewhere, where we're all in a boat and we didn't necessarily get on. In fact, we often didn't. And I've said many times that this was not a period of unity. And don't make that mistake when you analyse it. It was a period of creative struggle, of ideas, and not by very many women, a very small number of women, 
But as the years have gone by, those those pivotal struggles applied to everyone's life. You didn't have to be there for that to impact on you. So it's not an insider-outsider thing because history is very much made up of mistakes and you're just there. The reason I think I started to want to do this was because I realised I was the only person left. I was the only person still alive who had worked on all of the issues of me, Jane. And that really brought me up. There were three of us who'd worked on all of them and Gail Kelly and Bessie Guthrie were dead. And so I thought, well, it doesn't matter whether I can do this or not. I'm left. It's a very confronting moment. This boat, which is about five foot long and has on it all these individual figures carrying all kinds of artefacts, scrolls and objects, things that they've made that are of their culture. I call it, and we hid our secret knowledge even from ourselves. And it is about what do you do when you have to save your culture or your past or your memory? What do you do? These, these women floated off into the sea, what I call the sea of our amnesia. And I think that, that that's what our business is. That's what our collective business is, is not just being, not being nostalgic. I'm not a nostalgic person. I love my life now. It's based on that life, but it's this life now. But, and my relationship to that past sh shifts and changes. But that period 20 years ago when I needed to look at that moment in my life as a young woman and think about the things, the things helped me immensely, putting them together, having fun, it came as a, a fully formed idea. And I've enjoyed the last 20 years just kind of pulling it out and doing it all over the place and wherever. And, you know, when you do it for art students, they, they're thinking about it in terms of an art practice. It's not just pure history, it's multimedia. Um, it doesn't have to be about your time or something you remember. But I'm looking all the time for how we document perception shifts. And I think that's why it's relevant to this context. Anyway, these are just some of the other pre-dynastic artefacts. And um, I think I'll end with my most hopeful pre-dynastic artefact, observing and documenting the transit of patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> and all you need are these tools and a couple of laptops. This project continues to morph and uh, continues to interact with my own artwork. Um, I've got projects that I have added to it. Um, I've got a whole set of material on what I call the children's project, where I talked a lot to the young kids who were either children or nieces or what have you of women who were in women's liberation and believe me, their perceptions of what was going on was nothing like ours. Some of them thought it was appalling. I mean, their mothers were doing horrifying things and so that's legitimate to collect. And then I've also done some work on the Go to the Land projects because that's really important too and of course you can use fantastic satellites and things now and say all kinds of things about them. But there are ways to extend this and expand this as a form of storytelling, as a, t a form of women's history. I know that um, the first time I did it at an international conference, it was a women in archaeology conference, the Europeans loved it and said to me, this is archaeology. You have dug this building. Satire counts. So I think that, you know, for all those reasons, I'm deadly serious about this joke and I think that there are questions in there that perhaps we can all um, push a little further. So thank you very much. Thank you.